Oh, take me down to the Paradise Square where the grass is green and the staff and the backstage crew are suing the management for weeks and weeks of unpaid fees. Won't you please take me home? Oh my god, hey! Welcome back to my stage of YouTube channel. If you're seeing my face for the first time, my name is Mickey Joe, and I am obsessed with all things theatre. I'm a freelance theatre critic and a content creator based here in the UK and I talk about all things theatre happening on both sides of the Atlantic. You may recognise me from some recent videos I made about all of the drama happening at Funny Girl on Broadway. That was a lot. And literally at the same time as all of that was unfolding, another Broadway musical which opened this season announced that it would be closing early. I am talking about Paradise Square. Now this is a show that has been slightly embroiled in controversy since the beginning and it is certainly having a controversial exit from the Great White Way. We are going to unpack today why there is this drama surrounding the closing of Paradise Square, the reasons for its closing, and why there is now a bunch of legal fallout and lawsuits happening as a result of this production playing on Broadway. By the way, if I sweat profusely throughout this video, it's because it's 38 degrees here in the UK. I know Americans may be laughing at that temperature right now and thinking that I'm being a baby about it, but our buildings are not built to withstand this kind of heat. They are built to trap and lock the heat in. I don't have a balcony, I don't have a garden. It's boiling and not to be dramatic, but I'm dying. So before this show had even opened, it was highly anticipated critically. People were talking about it as though it was going to be the next Hamilton. And spoiler alert, no. But a lot of the Broadway community and the theatre community worldwide were apprehensive about the opening of this musical on Broadway because one of the lead producers was Garth Drabinsky. Now we need to go back a little bit to discuss who this man is and why he is such a controversial figure and why his presence in the show has essentially doomed it from the beginning. So the bizarre and controversial history of Garth Drabinsky as a figure in the theatre industry deserves its own full-length documentary. I'm going to give you the abridged version and summarise three, four decades of madness. So Garth Drabinsky is a Canadian film and theatre producer. He kind of became this impresario, one of the big personality producers of the 90s on Broadway. He has a background in law and he had made a certain amount of his money through buying cinemas in Canada and buying theatres in Toronto and trying to furnish Toronto as this sort of third theatre capital of the world after Broadway and the West End. Or the West End and Broadway, depending on which you think is more important. I'll let you have that debate in the comments section because I'm not getting into it. His biggest break during this time was getting to mount the Canadian arrival of the Phantom of the Opera. This would go on to run for a decade and make him presumably an awful a lot of money. Now, the Canadian version of Phantom of the Opera starred original Jean Valjean Colm Wilkinson and original Cassette, his daughter, Rebecca Kane. Not his real life daughter, his, his Les Mis daughter. I mean, not even his Les Mis daughter, his Les Mis adopted daughter now playing the young soprano upon which he is uh, sexually preying while singing Andrew Lloyd Webber music in an underwater cave. Da 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 da. So Cassette and Valjean basically reunite in Canada as Christine and the Phantom. Only this time their working relationship is marred by controversy. And there were articles put out about this at the time, but we are only now discovering really some of the depths of what happened here because Rebecca Kane has been very bravely and very powerfully speaking out about the abuse that she suffered during this time. She had a very tempestuous working relationship with Colm Wilkinson, who from her description was reasonably tyrannical on and off stage and was very physically aggressive with her during many moments of the show. She had spoken to him about this and his behavior did not change. She subsequently took this to the producers and Garth Drabinsky and they did not facilitate any kind of a change here. They did not advocate for her in this instance and she was made to feel as though this was her fault, that she was being a demanding diva actress for not wanting to be repeatedly injured in the workplace while on stage and made to feel unsafe in this environment in which she should have been protected by these people. If you want to learn more about this, she's spoken very openly about it on Instagram and TikTok and Twitter, Rebecca Kane. Go and read her story, go and find out more about that. She's a lovely, phenomenal talent. Again, this is just a summary to explain some of the context and what's happening here. Because for the last year, Rebecca Kane has been speaking out about this because of Garth Drabinsky's return to Broadway with Paradise Square and her concern for the company that he would now be overseeing. And she predicted a messy end to this entire production with people going unpaid, which 
So after the Phantom of the Opera, in the 90s, Garth Drabinsky founded a company called Livent and tried to really change the game of how theatre producing worked on Broadway. He worked on the original Broadway production of Ragtime and Parade and Fosse a lot of critical successes. However, around this time, Livent declared bankruptcy and this would be the end of Garth Trubinsky's rise to prominence. What emerged amongst this was the revelation that he had stolen over $500 million from various investors. And he was jailed for seven years from 2009 for several counts of fraud and forgery. It's kind of hilarious to me that around the same time Garth Drabinsky's undoing was happening, The Producers was the biggest success on Broadway in the very early 2000s, based on the Mel Brooks film in which a controversial Broadway producer known as the King of Broadway, this great impresario, misleads various investors in order to mount an enormous Broadway flop and commit massive fraud in order to make himself millions. In the show, The Producers, he then goes to jail at the end of it, but after he comes out of jail, goes straight back to producing on Broadway. And guess what happened with Garth Drabinsky? All the while, he has kept a foot in entertainment, and there have been various instances of people being unwilling to work with him based on his background and the way that his reputation has preceded him, not only for being financially dodgy AF, but also for being allegedly very tyrannical and abusive. But Paradise Square has been his first attempt to return to Broadway as a producer. And he's held the rights to this project for a little while since seeing earlier versions of the show. And I think from day one, this show has always been fated to be one that would only succeed if it was a huge critical success. It's trying to emulate the same thing that Hamilton has. It's a historic story, it has a racial component, and it has a modern infused score. That's an oversimplification of the success of Hamilton, but there's definitely a parallel that they're trying to draw here, which is why in the marketing for this show, they are trying to sell it as the next Hamilton. It's not dissimilar to a great many of the shows that Drabinsky had worked on in the 90s, Kiss of the Spider Woman, Fosse and Parade and Ragtime. These are critical darlings that weren't always commercially successful because they don't have that obvious commercial appeal, especially at a time when Disney was beginning to have such a big presence on Broadway. Say what you will about the man, his preference seems to be for producing discernibly high art musicals. So Paradise Square was never going to set box offices alight based on its name. It always had to win a huge amount of critical praise in order to succeed. However, what sets it apart from Hamilton is it wasn't able to penetrate the zeitgeist in the same way that Hamilton was at that early stage. And Hamilton won every award going. It won the Pulitzer Prize and the Tony Award and the Drama Desk and the Outer Critics Circle Award. And Paradise Square has not been as successful. In fact, creatively, the only major awards that the show has won have been the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Choreography and the Outer Critics Circle Award for Best Orchestrations. The breakout star of the show has been its leading lady, Joaquina Calocango, who won the Drama Desk and the Tony Award for Best Leading Actress in a Musical in a highly contested year, I will say. This cemented her as a rising star on Broadway to beat out Sharon D. Clark and Sutton Foster and other big heavyweights in that category. And this has also been the biggest selling point for Paradise Square from a broad perspective. She gave an amazing performance of the song Let It Burn on the Tony Awards, and that's been the thing that has really connected with theatre fans about this show. That will be the most memorable part of this when this show is forgotten down the line. And I do think that is probably its fate here, because nothing buries a show in history more than a legal scandal. Not to say it won't be remembered, it will make it very memorable, but we are unlikely to see this produced again. I do not anticipate a West End transfer, I do not anticipate a national tour, I don't anticipate them staging it in Toronto, that would be ironic. So Paradise Square in many ways has always been fated for a very limited life. Even before the Tony Awards, the grosses publicly were not good and a lot of people were questioning whether the show would even stay open until the Tony Awards. For many shows on Broadway in this position, there is a push to try and make the show last until this time to see if it wins enough categories in the Tony Awards that might extend its life. Because Tony Award wins do a lot more for a show's longevity and public profile than an Olivier Award win would in the UK. Cut to after the Tony Awards, where the Hollywood Reporter 
wrote an article about unpaid wages and discontent among the company for Paradise Square. There had also previously been an article, I believe in The New Yorker, about discontent backstage, about a hostile and toxic work environment. None of this came as a surprise to Rebecca Kane, who had not only predicted this, but characterized Garth Drabinsky as Scott Rudin, but maple syrup flavored. She questions why Rudin was no longer able to produce on Broadway under his own name, and Garth Drabinsky was. Now, Variety has written the most comprehensive article about this, so I'm going to read you a few pieces from this. This is Paradise Square closes on Broadway, leaving a trail of lawsuits. And they've reported that Actors' Equity has already taken the rare step of filing a federal lawsuit for $174,000 in unpaid health, pension, and 401k contributions. Equity is pursuing every avenue available to ensure the actors and stage managers of Paradise Square receive everything their contract guarantees them, the union said in a statement. Actors' Equity entered a settlement agreement with the show in May, under which the show agreed to pay $413,000. This is while it was still open. But according to a second lawsuit filed last Last week in state court in New York, the production has since defaulted on the agreement and still owes about $190,000. I like the expression about $190,000, as if that's a casual amount of money. It's not a casual amount of money. So United Scenic Artists, USA Local 829, which represents some of the crew, this is a union representing the crew, also filed suit last Thursday, claiming the production owes $156,965.85 in unpaid wages, dues, and retirement contributions. According to that lawsuit, the production representative failed to show up to a June 1st Zoom arbitration hearing to adjudicate the claim. Who can't get on a Zoom meeting? It's so easy now. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't even have to wear trousers. Come on, people. The arbitrator then ruled in favor of the union, and one of the terms stated, and now this is very interesting, if four of the designers, Alan Moyer, Don Holder, John Weston, and Tony Leslie James, are not paid within six months, they will get the rights to the show. That is a fascinating implication of this legal case. It goes on to talk about the general manager of the production, whose name I'm not going to begin to attempt to pronounce because it, it just doesn't have enough vowels, frankly. It states that he had also previously produced Reuben and Clay's Christmas Show, a Broadway show featuring Clay Aiken and Reuben Stoddard, which ran for three weeks in 2018. Actors' Equity also filed suit on that production, alleging that Aiken was not paid $60,000 in salary and that the production owed $15,000 for various other performers. So Garth Drabinsky is clearly not the only person attached to this production who has form and history when it comes to financial misdealings. Now, when the show announced closing, it was a very fast turnaround. It was an announcement that the show would be closing at the end of that week, and it closed over the weekend while all the funny girl news was emerging, which kind of allowed it to fly under the radar. That was a good PR move, but also they just wanted to close as quickly as possible because the longer that it stays open, the more unpaid wages are going to accumulate. And finally, the fallout from all of this is that Garth Drabinsky has been added to the Actors' Equity Do Not Work list. This means until the union decides otherwise, equity members will not be allowed to work on any shows that Garth Drabinsky is attached to, effectively preventing him from being able to produce on Broadway or equity tours. This is a huge, huge deal, but based on everything that we've seen here, surely one that should have happened a lot earlier. It has come about because of a letter written and co-signed by many members of the Paradise Square cast, alleging not only the financial mismanagement of the show, and obviously the fact that they were not paid in an appropriate and timely fashion, but also a hostile and toxic workplace environment backstage, in which Garth Drabinsky ruled like a tyrant and was not receptive to hearing any words said against him or the production. So what does this mean for the future of Paradise Square as a musical? Well, the rights for this show may be handed over to its designers based on the way that all of these legal proceedings subsequently go about. We know that a cast recording for the show is coming. I'll be fascinated to listen to that when it comes out because beyond the song that Joaquina performed at the Tony Awards, I really haven't heard much of this score. So I'll probably be doing a reaction to that cast recording here on YouTube down the line. If that's something you want to see, make sure you're subscribed to my channel. And generally, let me know what your thoughts are on all of this Paradise Square drama. I hope that I've explained a little bit more of what's going on, but it's such a bizarre situation. I have no further insights into it than what has already been said in the history of what we know about these people. It's very difficult from my perspective to read about all of these things that happened and 
kind of how some of the commercial failure of Parade and Ragtime can be attributed to the behavior of Garth Drabinsky. These amazing musicals that should have run longer than they did and should have been more successful than they did, that he was allowed to then produce again on Broadway, especially after the allegations brought to light by Rebecca Kane, is unconscionable to me. And while I'm grateful that Actors' Equity have now stepped in to prevent this happening again, it does seem like too little far too late. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section, especially if you got to see Paradise Square on Broadway. Let me know what you thought of the show, what you think the future for this show might be, if there is going to be any at all. And if you've seen any Garth Drabinsky shows in the past, or you have any other fun stories about him that you would like to share. Thank you so much for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel for plenty more stagey content coming very soon about all of your favorite shows. Also, feel free to give me a super like down below, that really helps me as a content creator, and you can go to patreon.com forward slash Theatre, where you can gain access to some exclusive photo and video content. I hope that everyone is staying safe and that you have a stagey day. For 10 more seconds I'm Mickey Joe Theatre. Oh my god, hey. Thanks for watching. Have a stagey day. Subscribe!